Professor Schmorley and Professor Raffelli and President Apologue, uh, thanks for this wonderful ceremony and uh, most of all for linking our names, my, my name, to uh, many of my heroes and past awardees of the Harvey Prize. It's truly a great honor. Uh, and the opportunity to tell you a little bit about my work. So uh, you see in front of you several amyloids, which are fibers, uh, which uh, come from normal proteins that have normal functions, but they've undergone a conversion from their normal soluble uh, natures into an insoluble uh, elongated fibril, which tends to aggregate. These have been known since, at least since the 1950s, found in autopsy samples from patients with many different diseases. Uh, these include uh, the prion diseases like the mad cow disease and Alzheimer's, uh, dialysis-related amyloidosis, which all patients on kidney dialysis eventually get, and even diabetes type 2. The fibrils are similar in appearance, though somewhat different thickness, all about one one hundred thousandth of a millimeter wide and then long, uh, several micrometers long. The fibrils, regretfully, don't form crystals. And what this means is that we have no way of learning their atomic structures. And atomic structure is important because if you know the atomic structure, well, then you have a chance to develop therapeutics uh, against the fibers. So first I have to say a little bit about learning atomic structures. The universal method was developed 98 years ago by a father-son team in England, the Braggs, um, crystal structure analysis. And they, they showed that if you can grow a crystal like the one shown in the upper left, you can scoop it up. Uh, today we do it just with a little loop of nylon. We put in a beam of x-rays, and when the crystal is in the beam of x-rays, the x-rays are scattered, or we say diffracted, and each x-ray, when it touches a detector or film, forms a spot, and these spots give enough information so that you can determine from them, and often they're a million spots, hundreds of thousands of spots, you can learn the uh, atomic structure of the substance that is forming the crystals. And uh, this substance will always be atoms or molecules. And you actually get a picture of it, like shown in the lower left here. And when you're used to these pictures, well, then you can build an exact atomic model of whatever that substance happens to be in the crystals. But if you don't have a crystal, no information, or very little. That was the situation with amyloid fibers. So here I've listed a whole group of horrible diseases that are associated with these amyloid fibers. In Alzheimer's, there are two different sorts of fibers, one outside of cells, A beta protein, another one tau inside of cells. In diabetes type 2, it's a protein called amylin, which forms fibers in the pancreas. Um, in uh, uh, dialysis-related amyloidosis, it's a blood protein that forms fibrils, and so forth. Uh, there are now 24 official amyloid diseases. Um, included in these are the prion diseases, like the mad cow disease and the other related diseases, uh, which are caused by or uh, associated with fibrils of a particular protein in our nervous system called the prion protein, or PRP. The prions are uh, a subclass of the amyloids which are transmissible. They can be transmitted from cell to cell or organism to organism. And as you know, uh, probably by eating tainted beef, uh, the uh, bovine disease can be transmitted to humans. And then there's still other diseases which are related to fibrils, which aren't yet classified as strict amyloid diseases, but may be including Parkinson's, Huntington's, and Lou Gehrig's disease. So all of these diseases have fibers 
like the ones I showed you. And in fact, in the background here, you see other of these fibers which come from the Alzheimer's protein A beta. So um, my, my students and I made three discoveries essentially relating to these. The first is that the fibril forming part of the protein isn't the whole protein. It had been thought earlier that the whole protein would somehow unwind and then rewind into the fiber. That's not the case. The fibril forming part is just a little bit of that protein. So most of these proteins are strings of them. They're all strings of amino acids up to hundreds of amino acids, but it's only six or seven or eight amino acids, a short segment, which form the fibrils. The second discovery is if you know which segment that is, and we worked out computer methods to determine which those segments are, now you can take those segments and you can grow crystals of the short segments. And now you can determine the atomic structure of that segment which is causing the fiber. Uh, the only problem is these crystals are extremely small, much smaller than the usual crystals that crystallographers work with. And the third discovery is that it's possible to design blockers to fibrilization. These aren't yet drugs, but maybe they're grandparents of drugs that could be developed from these blockers that stop fibrillation. So just to illustrate the size of the crystals, which was the technical problem that we had to overcome, here we have a crystal on the right which is typical of crystals of proteins that have yielded uh, 50,000 structures of different proteins, and it's about a third of a millimeter across, and that's uh, a small but usable crystal. And on the right shows the very largest crystal we've ever had from these amyloid segments, so about 35,000 of these crystals would fit in this crystal. And here are illustrated on the left, it's a mosaic of a hundred crystals used to determine the structures of amyloids. Uh, and just to show you how small they are, I'm in, going to enlarge four of them. Here I've enlarged the four from the box. What you see here is mainly it's a glass pin on which the crystal is held uh, just uh, by a little bit of its mother liquor. And the crystal is just this tin, thin little wispy thing on top. And you can see the, where the x-ray beam goes through the crystal with this circle. So um, we had to develop methods to uh, cope with this problem. And on the left, just to give this scale, this is an American dime of the, uh, which scales these crystals and gives you feeling for how small they are. But that was easy enough to overcome. What we learned is that these segments that form the fibers are extended. There are six amino acids, or seven in this particular uh, segment from a, a prion-like protein. And then each of the segments stack on one another in what's called a parallel sheet. And then there are two of these sheets together, and they mate very closely. And over here, you can see from the top of a, uh, a fiber, uh, you can see how they mate. The purple sheet mates to the gray sheet. And they just, uh, the, the atoms are absolutely touching one another closer than any two proteins which had ever been seen uh, before. And this, this uh, region where they mate, uh, we call this the steric zipper because these side chains, the chains uh, from the amino acid side chains, they just uh, really nearly touch each other just like the teeth of a zipper and it's completely dry. Proteins normally surrounded by water. The fiber is surrounded by water but in between these two protein sheets there's no water. It's completely dry. So this now shows you a little movie. Now we're looking down the fiber. You can see the teeth of the zipper. Now we're looking at a sheet. We'll rotate it the other way. And When you look down the edge you'll see the, the teeth of the zipper interdigitating. Um, once again, we'll just look down the top of the fiber and you can see the teeth interdigitating. So this was a new and unexpected type of protein structure. So how about blockers? Um, what we were able to do is to take, so far we've just done this for one of these proteins. It's the tau protein which forms fibers in Alzheimer's disease. 
And using our computer method, we were able to pick out the short segment which causes the, the tau protein to form fibers, just six amino acids shown here. And if we take these six amino acids alone, then we get fibers just from those six amino acids. But we also get these tiny crystals. From the crystals, we can get the atomic structure of uh, this uh, steric zipper, as we call it. Once we have the steric zipper, we know where the atoms are, and now we can design a cap to this fiber. We use computer design so that it will fit on top of the steric zipper, and it won't permit other molecules of this uh, six amino acid segment to continue the fiber. Now if we take the cap and we mix it with the soluble protein, now we don't get fibers. So at least in this one case, we're able to make a molecule that stops fibrilization. I should hasten to say this isn't a drug for Alzheimer's disease. It's too big, it has too many charges, but maybe people in pharmaceutical companies can learn how to make it into a drug. So uh, as Charles Bennett said, um, he had collaborators. My collaborators are my students and postdoctoral fellows. Here are some of them who worked out these projects, including Melinda Bell Burney, who grew those first crystals. She's the runner here. Uh, now, now she has three children. She's still working in the lab. Uh, last week we had a little lab party, and this is uh, some of the people, including Stuart Sievers, who designed that successful blocker. And as Charles Bennett mentioned, uh, one doesn't come to these projects uh, just working on one's own. I've had a whole group of mentors that I want to mention. Uh, as an undergraduate, I was so fortunate to um, be in the laboratory uh, of John Edsel. I was assigned to him. He was my undergraduate tutor. He was a pioneering biophysical chemist who lived into his hundredth year. And uh, I saw from him the great pleasure that he got from making discoveries. And he showed me uh, by example that you have to be fair to everyone involved in the process. Uh, my graduate work was with Charles Coulson. He showed me that you can often find simple solutions to complex problems. He was really great at doing that. Um, my postdoctoral supervisor in the lower left, Walter Kautzman, he showed me you can figure out things for yourself. He liked doing that every day, and he shared that with me. Paul Boyer, uh, still my senior colleague at UCLA, created a wonderful environment in which to work and gave me great encouragement. And then I also want to mention my mother-in-law, Barbara Tuckman, a historian, and I learned from her uh, that one can be independent. She was fiercely independent, thought through her ideas entirely by herself. When I first went to UCLA 40 years ago, she called Lucy and me on the phone and she said, don't work in a university, work on your own. That time I thought that was the craziest thing I'd ever heard. After 40 years in the university, I'm beginning to understand why she said that. <laughs> President Apolog welcomed us into the family of the Technion, uh, which is wonderful to hear. I want to say I already felt a little bit a member of the family when I learned from uh, the web that Leo Harvey was a Lithuanian immigrant to our home city who became a uh, machinist and then a great businessman and was so interested in pressing out frontiers of knowledge that he endowed this award, which I'm most proud to be a recipient of. Thank you. Thank you.